Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today, I would like to present you the Marmoset Brain Connectivity Atlas and uh, demonstrate to you how you can, you can use this open access resource uh, as a platform for discoveries. Um, in the two previous presentations, we, 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 um, we learned how we can investigate various kinds of connectivity in a human as well as non-human primates and, and rodents. And let me quickly recapitulate the, the, the main points of the two previous presentations. So in essence, uh, it is important to, 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 to uh, study uh, the comprehensive um, wiring diagram of the, uh, of the brain uh, because it is critical, it's fundamental for, for understanding how the brain processes information. And we do it by, uh, by um, creating models of various kinds, theoretical models, computational models, conceptual models, any kind of models, in fact. And these models, in order to be useful, in order to uh, provide reasonable uh, insight, have to be fueled with a reliable data. In this case, data on connectivity. And uh, as we've seen, uh, it is, especially when it comes to human, um, we cannot always measure everything we would like to. For instance, we cannot perform any invasive experiments. And therefore, we fall back to uh, animal models, uh, such as uh, mouse or non-human primates, and among them, uh, the common marmosets. Uh, common marmosets are new, new world primates, and they are relatively small, so are their, their brains. As you can see on this comparison, the surface of the marmoset cortex is approximately 12 times smaller in comparison with macaque. Um, nonetheless, the marmoset brain preserves all the uh, defining features of the primate brain. And marmosets have become increasingly popular among, uh, among recent years, and they turned out to be extremely uh, useful animal model. They're the first non-human primates for which, uh, uh, for which uh, the genome was sequ sequenced and stable transgenic lines have been obtained. Uh, marmosets, as you can see on this movie, are very social animals and they exhibit amazing repertoire of, of hearing and, and vocal communication behavior, and which is a subject of numerous studies. Uh, finally, they are a convenient model for investigating mesoscale connectivity, and as we will learn uh, tomorrow from, from Alex, um, for instance, they, they uh, constitute a fundamental part of the Japanese um, program on brain research. Mm. But as we, as we heard from, from David Kennedy, uh, investigating connectivity in primates is extremely challenging. It's very difficult, and this could be, this could be uh, noticed if we compare the existing body, the existing resources on mouse connectivity, when the injections are counted in hundreds, if not thousands, um, and they cover the, the entire brain, and sometimes they go even outside the brain. So, um, and the data is provided in a very sort of uh, modern way, let's, let's, let's say that this is uh, specially co-registered and it's all available online. Um, for primates, we simply do not have this throughput. It's much more challenging. And uh, so perhaps we can place marmosets somewhere in between to, 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 fit, to fit this gap. Um, let's see. Uh, regardless of the species that we use, if we think of an ideal uh, toolkit, ideal resource for uh, investigating connectivity, um, how, how, what features should it have? Uh, what, how should it look like? And there is a consensus uh, that, uh, of course, from the technical standpoint, it should, uh, should obey all the standards and best practices, including the, the FAIR principle. But from the perspective of the end user, um, it it, uh, primarily, it should provide access to the quantitative results on connectivity, as well as, uh, as, well as it should allow us to access the primary data, the, the primary unprocessed experimental data. And this is critical from the perspective of reanalysis of the data in the future, in perhaps with new tools and methods, as well as um, it will allow us to reinterpret the, the data in the light of evolving knowledge, novel hypothesis. Um, it also should provide us a, should allow for broad range of analysis. For, for instance, uh, we would definitely like to do old, old good old uh, graph-based network analysis, but some of us uh, tend to choose alternative form. They would like to abstract for any, any kind of parcellation and 
perform purely spatially based analysis. Um, of course, we will, we, it is critical to be, to be able to use the results in a translational and comparative context, and therefore there should be sufficient level of, of uh, compatibility and interoperability with other tools, methods, modalities, or projects that investigate connectivity. And as you can see, these requirements po they, they pose a lot of challenges. Uh, the most critical, I would say it's a organizational, uh, organizational one, but we have to address all of them. So um, how we address this in, in our project? Let me start by explaining the uh, experimental paradigm be behind, uh, behind our project. It essentially rises relies on injections of monosynaptic retrograde fluorescent tracers into the marmoset cortex. The tracer is injected, it is picked up by axonal terminals, it transport, it's transported retrograde, retrogradely across the entire brain, where it labels bodies of individual neurons. And uh, then the brain is sectioned, the sections are, some of them are stained, some other are investigated under fluorescent microscope, where locations of individual cell bodies are identified. This provides us information on the direction of a connection uh, because we rely on uh, we rely on retrograde connectivity, re retrograde axonal transport. This also uh, facilitates subsequent quantification of the results because uh, we have our well-defined quantum of connectivity, which is single labeled neuronal body. And so far, the body of data that we that we accumulated uh, comprises uh, approximately. 300 injections, and as you can imagine, processing this amount of data is, is manually is next to impossible due to extremely laborious nature of such process. Therefore, we have to create some sort of a computational solution to facilitate and streamline this process. And the infrastructure behind the project is quite complex. However, if I were to uh, pinpoint uh, the, the single critical step, that would be mapping the experimental data set into the uh, syntactic space of the reference brain atlas. And this process consists of uh, a few steps. In the first one, we, we take the unaligned stack, we reconstruct it into uh, what resembles a single hemisphere of the marmoset brain, which is then further refined by the means of the formable mappings, um, which uh, result in a reconstruction that is much more smooth, in which individual anatomical features are much uh, more pronounced. And this 3D image is then mapped into the stereotactic atlas with full 3D to 3D uh, mappings. A unique feature of our pipeline is the use of, of so-called label maps, which are indicated here with the uh, patches of various colors. These are essentially outlines of individual cortical areas drawn manually by, by neuroanatomists. And while you may think that in, in including such a step in a process that's supposed to be automatic, uh, it doesn't make really a lot of sense. But on the contrary, it does. It actually is very important because it greatly increases the uh, um, accuracy of the registration process by forcing the algorithm to, 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 to overlap corresponding label maps. Sometimes it actually even decreases the time that it takes to compute such mapping. Uh, but, but fundamentally, it's, it's, a, it's a critical part of our quality assurance uh, procedure in which we make sure that whatever mapping we, we calculate, uh, it is biologically relevant, that we do not generate any spurious results. Mm, yes, yeah, so once we have a recipe for traversing between uh, our experimental data set and surtaxic coordinates, we can use, use it to map locations of individual neurons into the uh, surtaxic space, but we can uh, do the contrary, we can take the atlas segmentation and map, in back, map it back onto our experimental data set. This gives us information on stereotactic location of each labeled neuron, as well as allows us to easily or easily determine the number of neurons in each cortical area. And we applied this procedure to uh, over uh, 50 marmoset brains, which translates into, uh, into um, almost 150 injections, encompassing uh, a little bit less than, uh, than the half of the all, all cortical structures that, that are defined in the atlas. And for each of the inter-aerial uh, connection that we found, uh, we, we determined its direction and strength using the fraction of extrinsic labeled neurons, neurons, which is a measure that is commonly used in, in uh, track tracing to quantify the results of track tracing studies in mouse uh, and, and macaque. But also to add another dimension to our data and to allow analyses that are 
um, that concern feed forward and feedback nature of the connection connections, uh, we also quantified the, the, the fraction of supragranular supragranular neurons uh, in each of these interarial connections that we found. Um, this altogether uh, provided us with a, with a comprehensive qu quantitative data set on rec retrograde cortical cortical uh, connectivity, which at this specific moment of, of time might be the most comprehensive, uh, which was probably going to change in the future, but, but at this specific moment that's, that might be the case. Um, but this is still not enough. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, just merely getting uh, the data is, 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 is not enough. Uh, an ideal resource should go well beyond this point. First, by providing researchers with a means of accessing expo and exploring the data, and secondly, by adding additional layers of data uh, to, to better contextualize the results of the connectivity studies. And to address the first, uh, the first uh, issue, we, we developed the marmosatbrain.org portal that you can access anytime. And it has this nice and sleek interface that allows you to pick any of the 143 injections that we uploaded and uh, investigate the underlying high resolution histology, uh, check out the locations of the specific individual labeled neurons, uh, as well as um, take a look at the overall patterns of connectivity uh, using uh, the, the, the flat map view. Uh, this interface provides also an access to the, uh, to the connectivity matrix, uh, as you can see here. Uh, you can explore it down to the, to the uh, smallest detail and uh, you can customize and adjust the view just to, just to get a better, get better uh, view of what you're interested in. There's alternative view that we call the graph view and this, the purpose of this one is to uh, allow you to better appreciate the spatial distribution of the projections. Uh, each case comes with an extensive set of metadata, including comments, sometimes very personal comments, from the uh, neuroanatomist who actually conducted the surgeries and helped in processing the data. There are a few other widgets, like this one, where you can grab the brain, spin it around, and uh, simply en enjoy the view, I believe. Um, so I highly encourage you to go, uh, go online, check out this portal. Um, now let's move a little bit behind the scenes. Um, this is the, 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 um, the structure behind the portal. I don't want to go through this because it's, it's complex and unnecessarily complex. Um, but, but the main point here is that we, we provide two streams of accessing the data. One through, uh, through this web browser interface that I just showed you. And the second one, it's, it's a programmatic way of accessing the data through dedicated application programming interface. And therefore, we, you can employ computers to, to, to go to the portal, fetch the data, and, and, run, it, and run any calculations you're interested in. Um, a few numbers, as I mentioned, there's uh, like 53 cases. This translates into over 7,500 of, of, of individual sections, um, which in total is like 2.7 tera, tera pixels of imaging data. But for the purpose of serving, serving it online, we, we compress them down, and, and it's only 85 gigabytes, more or less, to, to put up online. Uh, recently, we started monitoring who is visiting, who is using our portal, because that, that, that feels interesting, right? And it seems that we have a pretty decent fan base. Uh, you may, we may say that, oh, that's not really a lot. And, well, just think how many researchers would like to access a data set on structural connectivity in Marmoset on an everyday basis. Uh, I think there are a few, but not that many. However, um, however uh, but in terms of how long the users are staying, like most of them are bouncing off, but this is typical for any website. Uh, but we have a group of hardcore users who, who seem to be uh, really enjoy browsing our, our, our website and stay over 10 minutes um, regularly. Um, in terms of the countries of origin, uh, it's mainly US, followed by Japan, then there is Australia, however the internal traffic is excluded, so it's mostly, it's mostly Sydney. Uh, this is followed by Canada and then France and then the rest of the world. Um, right, uh, as we as we seen on the during the first lecture, it's very important to be able to study the connectivity versus topographical organization of the cortical areas. And we would like to enable these, the same kind of analysis in Marmoset. Therefore, uh, we introduced a, a, a computational model that allows us to incorporate these factors. Uh, it stems from an assumption that, uh, that uh, axonal bundle connecting two points in the brain would, would 
prefer to choose the shortest or the cheapest way, the geodesic path, and uh, we could formalize it in the, in, in the following way. Let's assume that uh, it's cheap to traverse or easy to traverse through white matter, it's very expensive to go through gray matter, and going outside the brain, it's, uh, it's impossible, it's no-no. And let's impose these conditions and, and use fast marching method to solve this, uh, to numerically solve this problem, and the, the result is gonna be the geodesic path, and we associate the distance of this geodesic path with a distance. And this formalism allows us to introduce the, the concept of inter-aerial distances, which, which essentially it's a measure that would tells us how far apart from each other two cortical, cortical areas are. But also we can go deeper and start investigating the, the, the distribution of distances for individual labeled cells. What do I mean by that? So here we have an injection that's labeled approximately 60,000 neurons and we can uh, go down and compute the distance from each labeled neuron to its injection side, to, to the injection site. And uh, this opens new avenues of exploring the various properties of the, of the connectivity patterns versus the distance. Uh, but I think it also enables us to, to, to study the intrinsic connectivity, which, uh, which do not take into account when investigating, uh, when using the uh, area-based um, connectivity. And altogether, this formalism allows us to, to to give us a framework for analyzing the connectivity data in the context of, in the spatial context. Now, uh, another, another layer of data uh, is, the, is the neuronal density, and uh, we have measured this neuronal density in, in marmoset cortex for all 116 areas uh, in the study, uh, in the recently published study. Uh, in essence, except for providing an average neuronal density for each area, we also measured the, the, the neuronal density across uh, cortical profile. Here, here we have two, two examples of such, such profiles. Uh, yet again, this data is available online, it can be used and it's there. Mm, a sort of byproduct of this study was a, was a measure of a cortical thickness for specific individual, individuals in which we measured the, the neuronal density. Um, so this is essentially another, another layer of data. Now, um, now I'd like to show you an, ex uh, an example analysis that we can run with the track tracing data from Armoset that, uh, that, uh, that we got. Um, and the, the tethering hypothesis and the concept of connectivity grading was explained in detail by Daniel just a just, just few minutes ago, but, so I will do not go over this again. And, but one of the implications that, um, that probably qu requires highlighting is that, is that uh, due to the cortical expansion and so, the, the connections in the, in the primary areas should be or, or are expected to be rather compact and short-ranged in contrast to the um, connectivity in, uh, in transmodal or, or association areas in prefrontal cortex, parietal, and temporal cortex. So uh, the question is whether this, this can be actually observed and whether this is phylogenetically conserved. So um, the first, one of the first studies that explicitly addressed this issue uh, quantitatively uh, used uh, human resting state fMRI, and indeed what they found is that the, the connectivity of the primary areas is compact and short range, but the further you go from the, uh, from the primary areas, the connectivity is more widespread and more long range. But this is human resting state fMRI. Um, the follow-up question is whether we can observe it in, in macaque. And indeed, a, a study was conducted, a follow-up study was conducted, and a similar phenomenon was observed. Um, so another question, can, are there any structural underpinnings of this, of this, of this functional observation? And uh, with an with a, with a available body of data on, on, on uh, macaque track tracing data from, um, from, from Professor Kennedy lab, it, the observation confirmed what was, what, what, what was found, uh, what was known from the functional imaging. And, you know where this is going. Uh, we took uh, our marmoset track tracing data and, uh, and conducted very similar analysis. We calculated what's the average length of a connection uh, for, for each injection and also for each area. And indeed, as you can see, when, when we take a look at the primary areas, these are the one outlined in, in, in black, um, similar, uh, similar tendency 
similar trend emerges and this observation can be quantified and it's quite robust um, and, it, and it's quite robust. Now, um, there, there were a few regions of the brain which, which caught our attention and we want to um, conduct more detailed analysis. But then what happened is that uh, we had a, uh, a model user, which is uh, Daniel Margulis and Randy Bruckner, model, model user of our website who went to the website and downloaded the data and used it to make discoveries totally independently from us. And uh, what they found is that by arranging the, the areas from primary to trans model, they identified that there is a, there is a, a peak trans model network which is highly interconnected. You can see this by, by this dark uh, brownish uh, shade. And uh, they concluded that that Marmoset seems to have what they called apex transmodal network, uh, which uh, fulfills a condition for a structural homologue of a, to, the to the human default mode network. What does it mean is that, uh, is that uh, this requires, of course, further studies, but from the perspective of the resource, we can say that the data, the track tracing data that we published enabled uh, and the identification of such, uh, of such uh, homologue. Um, and I think that's the that's the um, that's a great example of how this data can be utilized. Of course, this is this is just one example of of, of, of analysis. I think that the key keyword here is flexibility. Uh, we try to provide uh, we try to enable the broad range of analysis in two ways by providing multiple layers of data as well as making it easy to access the data and make a use of it. And the data has been around for. 18 months or so, and during this time, um, there are several studies that were conducted by, uh, um, by exclu uh, exclusively based on our data or partially based on, on our data. By the way, we also found monosynaptic connections between auditory uh, cortex and, and, and visual cortex. So, also, the, the, this confirmed observation that was made in, in, in macaque, monkey. Right. Um, I will. In the last slide, I would like to emphasize that this is a highly collaborative project, um, primarily between, between the Nansk Institute and the Monash University, and, uh, specifically the laboratory of Professor Marshall Rosa. And uh, this is essentially where all the experimental work is conducted. Um, and in Poland, just across the fence, at the Nansk Institute, all the computational and anal analytical part is taking place. And um, of course we collaborate with many other groups um, across the world, uh, including the, the Japanese Brain, um, Brain Minds program. Mm. And this project was possible due to multiple sources of founding. Uh, one of them is being the INCF seed founding, which may, feels me obliged to stand here in front of you and just let you know what, what you guys got in, in return. And uh, I think that that would be almost the last slide. Yeah, so I invite you to visit my demo station today and, uh, and discuss either the connectivity or perhaps some other, other aspects of, of Marmoset uh, brain anatomy. Thank you.